Sidewalk Infrastructure Partners, or SIP, is a company spun out of Sidewalk Labs that's focused on the future of infrastructure. Last year, SIP launched a company called Cavnew, whose mission is to build the world's most advanced roads. We've been talking to some of the folks at Cavnew about their exciting new projects, and today we are joined by Tyler Duval. Tyler is the co-founder and chief executive officer of Cavnew. Before joining Cavnew, he was the CEO of the SH-130 Concession Company, which is a public-private toll road partnership in Central Texas. He was previously a principal at McKinsey and also served in several roles in the U.S. Department of Transportation, including as acting undersecretary for policy. So, Tyler, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me, Vanessa. It's exciting. Tyler, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're really excited about Cavnew. Um, I wanted to know, you know, to hear from you, what's the story behind the creation of Cavnew? Why is now the right moment for this type of company to emerge? It's a great, great question, Eric. I mean, I think, you know, we have this confluence of factors emerging in, in transportation and society and in the broader economy around the world. And, you know, it just, you know, you have multiple forces that have driven us to this point. I think most importantly, we have a transportation network that is in desperate need of innovation. Uh, we need the innovation shock that I think many other sectors of the economy have experienced. You've seen you know, healthcare, you've seen the broader tech sector, you've seen education, you've seen telecommunications, energy, all of these sectors have seen this wave of innovation and investment by some of the most brilliant people in the world. Uh, transportation infrastructure has lagged that wave. Uh, and now is, I think, the, the time to, to kind of bring bring all the intelligence, bring bring the new thinking uh, to our, our road system. Uh, obviously, our road system has underperformed because it hasn't had that. We've seen congestion levels that have spiked uh, around the world in metropolitan areas. We've seen environmental uh, problems and CO2 emissions. The transportation sector now is, is the major contributor in many countries to CO2 emissions. And we've just generally seen an overall uh, decline in safety performance too around the world. So this is a, a multi-tiered problem. Uh, and at this moment, we finally see the technologies that others have benefited from coming to fruition in, in, in our market now. Uh, obviously, the autonomous vehicle revolution happening on the vehicle side was also happening as this as this was starting to take place. And so I think, you know, again, we do have this great confluence. Uh, the time is right. Uh, we obviously have a a new administration that's going to focus intensely on uh, innovation in the United States, but also uh, around the world, we see it. So I, I couldn't have joined at a better time. Uh, some of it was dumb, dumb luck, but uh, I think most of it was uh, was good thinking. So Obviously, you've named a, a lot of the challenges that are facing, you know, cities uh, right now in terms of road and infrastructure. When you think about the biggest areas of need for advanced road technology, what do you think they are? Yeah, so we're, we've been thinking about multiple use cases. Obviously, in the in the urbanized environment, you have you know what's called you know boulevard roadways or you know roadways with some you know features of entry and exit that are not you know typical of a limited access highway. So not non interstate roadways that serve you know hundreds of thousands of vehicles per day on many of our uh, biggest cities in the United States. Uh, these roadways are uh, dilapidated. Uh, facing significant physical constraints. Uh, we've got obviously a lot of concerns in communities around uh, road projects in and around those areas. And so, you know, you basically just see a systematic problem with those specific sets of roadways. They're high, you know, high, pre-COVID, highly congested, uh, highly inefficient and producing lots of external neg negative external externalities that uh, we're going to focus on. That's kind of use case one, and that's what our Michigan project in some ways has started to be focused on. Use case two is the interstate highway system itself, which is you know the largest public works project in the history of the world. Uh, the United States built it out, similar to what we saw in Germany, the autobahn. The Chinese are building a similar network today. So we have, you know call it the major freight network of the United States. Uh, this is the envy of the world in many cases because it's so big, but it's not operating that efficiently uh, today. So we have a massive physical capacity, but not necessarily a lot of operating efficiency. So our long haul freight networks, I think, are need to be modernized, right? We need uh, more uh, tech, technology oriented interstates. We need much safer roadways. We have a huge number of fatalities in the truck sector tied to unsafe roads and other conditions related to that. So I think our, our, our one of the most exciting things we're starting to talk to states about is, you know, multi-state truck corridors uh, to where we can actually have, you know, autonomous or augmented travel uh, that will go safer, faster, more reliably, and, and frankly, more productively for, for, for the trucking industry that has seen driver shortages and, and other problems. And, and obviously, most importantly, in some ways, clean, cleaner trucks too, long term. 
So I think that's use case two. Then the, the third one that we're getting really interested in are these, uh, you know, co- call it you know, bo- bottleneck areas in and around major points. So think about seaports and airports where you see huge distribution facilities, the explosion of Amazon and Walmart and others who are building these massive distribution facilities to reorient towards the current economy. There are big opportunities to rethink how we serve those, those points. Uh, and autonomous travel coming into and out of those distribution facilities, uh, I think it could has the potential to save you know huge amounts of resources, redeploy those resources to higher and best, best you know better use cases, et cetera. So those are kind of the, the three big ones. And then obviously there's you know the urban transportation environment is so complex that you know we're, we're going to have to be nimble to kind of work on lots of different projects. I mean uh, you know there is no point to point commuter route anymore. Commuters are moving in very diverse and complex ways. No one appreciated 35, 40 years ago who were planning a lot of these metropolitan routes how complex the demand profile was going to be for urban transportation. So, you know, imagine a hybrid of, you know, call it the boulevard option and the interstate option. So in Michigan, we're working on both Michigan Avenue and Interstate 94. And that's because, you know, travel in that corridor is not simple. It's, you know, you've got a transit service in the corridor, you've got heavy freight traffic in the corridor, and then you've got a lot of point-to-point commuter service as well. So it's transportation to me is the most complex network of all the utilities. Uh, and as a result, I think our business model is going to have to be pretty, pretty nimble. Tyler, you mentioned the Michigan project, and I think we want to talk a little bit more about that in a second. But first, I wanted to kind of make sure uh, listeners are, are um, they understand when you talk about connected infrastructure, what you mean. How do you define that? And why is it so essential to this future you're talking about? Right. So, I mean, we're, we're using, obviously, our, our the name of our company has both connected and autonomous in it. Uh, so it's a create, creative use of that. I think both with connected, I think it's it's the extent to which vehicles are communicating with each other and communicating with roadside infrastructure. For, for many years, there was a sense that vehicles and manufacturers would solve the connected vehicle problem through creating their own technology platform. So, you know, BMW would work with General Motors, would work with Toyota to basically figure out a communications platform so that all vehicles on roadway are talking to each other at all times. Signals are being sent from a driver who's, you know, three miles ahead that there's a, an emerging dangerous condition on the roadway. There'd be communication around uh, other events that are happening to allow drivers to make different choices. And that started to happen, but it's happened much more slowly than I think people projected, you know, say 10 years ago when I, when I actually started working on this in some ways. Uh, I think the, the infrastructure side where, where you know, what's happening on the roadway that the you know, projections around that, the forecasts and the actual conditions around it. We found that the, 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 the installation of hardware on the roadway can actually help us really mitigate some of the gaps in that communications platform between the vehicle manufacturers. So uh, our company, we believe, sits at this intersection of all of this innovation among the, ve- uh, the vehicle manufacturers and puts us right in the middle on the roadway side. So, you know, our goal is that our hardware solution backed with the digital twin that I know our CTO w- will be talking about soon, will give an operating platform so that everybody knows everything that's going on at all times around the conditions of the roadway, hazards, other efficiencies that we can bring to it. Transit vehicles can understand where they can pick up and drop off more efficiently. They can build a dynamic aspect of this to the communication side. And then we can talk more about the autonomous side, but that's ultimately, you know, the biggest long-term benefits to society and to the economy are going to come from unlocking autonomous travel. Uh, it, It is truly one of the top three or four most important innovations, I think, in the history of the United States and, and hopefully the world. And I think, you know, as you'll hear from our C- CTO, the challenges that the vehicle manufacturers have had to deal with all the complexity of the edge, as they call it, the edge case complexity is much bigger. She used the term infinite, uh, which maybe she'll use again uh, later when you guys talk to her. But I mean, this is just so compelling to listen to people who spend their lives trying to crack these problems on the vehicle side talk about how much easier it would be if they had an infrastructure side solution to complement that. And that's what we've decided to build our company around. So you guys have some really interesting projects coming coming up uh, down the line. Um, we, you already mentioned one, Michigan. Hopefully we'll talk about the other one too, but let's start there. I mean, what is the Michigan project going to be and what are you excited to learn from it? Right. So it's a, you know, it's our flagship project. The way we think of Michigan, it's the, you know, we call it the top down solution. If you're stepping back and you said, hey, we want to d- design a autonomous vehicle laneway between two points and we want to you know, create a playing field or 
pilot area to do that in. That's what Michigan is. So the, the governor of Michigan, who's been very supportive of us, lieutenant governor of the Michigan Department of Transportation, basically said, you've got a 40 plus mile stretch between two major points, Ann Arbor, where the University of Michigan is, uh, and downtown Detroit. Uh, and in the middle, we have the airport, uh, one of the biggest airports in North America, and figure out how to, you know, what the, what the route should be, what the commercial model should be, what the technology solution should be, what the civil engineering design should be. Figure all that out, come to us, work with us, partner with us, and then, and then we'll, we'll sign a long-term implementation agreement. So we're about six months into the project, uh, have great progress, great partnership. The state has been incredibly uh, receptive to working with us. They've got great experts as well. And so right now we're, let's say, in the deep throes of you know, project planning and design. Uh, and our tech team, technology team, has got to figure out what the technology stack looks like. Is it, is it a hardware kit every 100 yards? Is it every 350 yards? What do the vehicles need to deliver the confidence that state governments are going to need that this is a safely designed uh, you know, hardware system, software platform, et cetera. So all of that's underway. We're in a full sprint. And I think one of the, you know, my background is more on the commercial financial and legal side. And, you know, one of the things that's very interesting is we're really redefining what a partnership with state government looks like. Um, there are many technology firms that are selling specific products or services, and there are many firms that are looking to, you know, privatize a toll road, for example. We're, we're not doing either. We're here as a long-term operating partner, uh, tech technology partner. Uh, and I think that's that's where we see the breakthrough, which is a new, a new model of partnership where government can turn to the private sector who's pushing all this innovation and get it into the roadway faster and easier than they would have been able to do it solely up by themselves. Tyler, can you tell us um, a little bit about the other project that, that CAVNU recently launched as well? I think this is in Maryland or metropolitan DC area. Um, what is what is that project, and what is the the kind of what are the objectives there? Right. So, look, the, you know, we're really excited. Obviously, the Michigan project. We thought, that, you know, this was we're going to spend all of our time on that, and then, like any great idea, we realized there are lots of other people interested in the idea. So, we've already won our second major project in partnership with uh, Transurban and Macquarie, two major uh, toll road developers and financiers, uh, two of the best in the world. Uh, we're a partner on the what's called the the I two seventy I four ninety five managed lane the largest road project in North America. And it's a basically an extension or expansion of the managed lane network that started in Virginia. And these are lanes that are dynamically priced. So a driver will come up, see, see the price based on the current congestion levels in the lane and decide, is it worth 68 cents a mile, 42 cents a mile, 12 cents a mile to use the lane tied to reliable speeds. Uh, and, and that's been proven successful in I think over 10 cities in the United States now very popular. And right now the private sector basically is pioneering this technology platform. And our role is to be the long-term future-proofing partner to the project. Because the project is a 50-year contract, it's pretty certain that over that time period, there'll be substantial innovation and disruption to the way we travel, we all hope. Um, and it, in that regard, we're, we're the partner to ensure that happens seamlessly in the most sophisticated way possible and to benefit the public. So uh, it's a great role. It's a large scale greenfield project. So this will take many years to develop, uh, but uh, it's pretty exciting for a, a small company like ours to already be involved in the largest project in North America. Very exciting. And so when you look ahead and you imagine what's what's to come, I mean, what would success look like for CAVNU, do you think? And and what are the obstacles that <laughs> might make it hard to achieve it? I feel like I'm back in McKinsey with that kind of question. <laughs> uh, uh, no, look, I think, you know, there's obviously near term, medium term and long term. That's always the kind of way to think about these things. I think in the near term, you know, successful delivery of the Michigan project is, is job one. Uh, it's our highest priority, uh, most important platform to, to test out the concept of CAVNU. And is it real? Can it work, et cetera? Obviously, delivering on Maryland and being a really good partner to both the state and to our consortium partners there is job two. Uh, and then we've got a pipeline that's already emerging. So we've already, you know, we're in conversations now with, I think, over 10 different state governments, talked to some international governments. The appetite for this is in incredible. Uh, and I think, you know, for us, I'd say if I used to say a two year horizon, I, you know, I'd like to have two to three more projects moving forward in some sort of contract phase with with some with the government. Uh, and then we, you know, hopefully say from two to five years using a medium term horizon, you'd love to grow that to 10 or 12. And, you know, the point there being we've, we've got confidence from the public that this works. 
We've got the auto industry saying that their products can safely move on these lanes. And we have government officials saying that it achieves the multiple policy objectives that they've set out for these projects, which are which are multiple. I mean, these are not single policy objective projects, as you know. So I think all of that, you know, two to five year time period, hopefully we'll have live things out there. People can experience these these roadways. Um, and, you know, the public will, will have confidence in them. And then beyond that, you know, we, we do view this as a longer term, almost utility model. We'd love to be the kind of 24 seven utility provider to states, you know, take on a network, an area wide system, as opposed to just single point to point service. Uh, that would be that would be where I think efficiently it should go. Now, obviously, states need to be comfortable with that. Um, and, you know, we're, 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 we've got great partners, obviously, with Alphabet and with Ontario teachers. Uh, we've got great partners with the industry. I, you know, I've done a lot of consulting and I've run businesses. I've never seen the conditions for success come together like, like they've come together here at the moment that has happened. So. That is great to hear. Tyler, one last question for you, and then we'll let you go. Um, you know, Vanessa and I and, and everybody at Sidewalk, we spent a lot of time thinking about how technology um, and how companies like Cavnew can impact the future of cities, can impact people's lives in a positive way. What impact do you hope Cavnew can have on the people who live in cities and the metropolitan areas that are connected by your roads? It's a great question, Eric. And, and you know, first of all, thanks so much for your time. I mean, this is I'm a huge fan of Sidewalk. I've always I followed followed you all from the beginning of your formation, and uh, you know, you, you've made major contributions. And I think the problem statement that Sidewalk Labs was founded on is not that dissimilar from what what ours is, which is we want to make a positive contribution to the way people live, and that includes obviously safe safe travel, reliable travel. There are populations that can't access that today. Uh, you know, there are major disruptions that are happening around the way we move that cause huge uh, economic effects and dislocation. And obviously, they're just the major obvious impacts negatively of, of congestion and safety on the roadway every day. You know, it's not acceptable that 40,000 people die every year. That's 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 not something that we should be you know, saying, yeah, that's okay. It's not acceptable that people are wasting hundreds of hours in their cars with all other, you know, environmental and health effects associated with that. It's, it's just not acceptable. And if we can solve it with technology, why not? Why, why wouldn't we solve it? And, you know, I think the, the problem with transportation is people have just gotten really complacent about how solvable these big problems are. And I used to say when I was in government that this is the easiest big problem to solve in society. You know, uh, healthcare is tough. I mean, education is tough. Uh, this is tough, but it's easier than those. And we can solve them with, with uh, technology. Uh, and, I, you know, it will have profound ramifications on the way cities develop. Uh, the way where people live, how they live, the benefits they achieve from transportation. I mean, I, you know, I've done a lot of research and looking at, you know, the real estate impacts of inefficient transportation. I mean, everything about the way particularly American cities have developed have been in some ways a response to inefficiencies embedded in our transport networks. And, you know, hopefully we can help correct that. That's that's not an overnight easy problem to solve. But if we start to unwind some of the in, the disincentive, pro, you know, basically the incentive problems that are embedded in our transportation system that, that impact everything else, then maybe we can have a more profound effect than I would, would have imagined. So, Great answer. Thank you, Tyler. We really appreciate your Thank you, Tyler. Time. Thank you, Eric and Vanessa.